Hey, this is Tom at Talon Guitar Works, and after hell week of moving all my stuff in here and moving about 70% of my shop into the garage um, and having a two-day yard sale and uh, maximum heat down here in Florida, I'm going to take a break today. And I'm going to talk about um, where the guitar industry is going and, and where it came from, because you have to get the history of that right to understand why we're now reaching equilibrium with the European and uh, uh, Japanese or Asian guitar markets and what's going on and what to look for in the future. Right now I'm calling it uh, guitar Mageddon in the United States because I'm seeing insane pricing on some guitars, either way high or way low. And part of this is driven by the, the post-COVID um, sales that happened where you had people that had means that thought they were going to be locked in their home for a year to decided I'm going to buy a really nice guitar and learn how to play it. Well, they didn't get locked in their home for a year and they never learned to play that guitar. And now those guitars are being reintroduced to the market. And uh, with, you know, our economy the way it is with, uh, you know, the interest rates climbing and everything happening out the way it is, People are getting rid of excess stuff that they really don't need. Now, understanding where we are now, you have to first understand how it happened. And nothing happens by chance. Everything is cause and effect when it comes to economy. And the first thing I'm going to mention is, um, after World War II, 1945, uh, the British had an embargo on American guitars. And... This is right in that time period where skiffles getting really popular in England and then the advent of rock and roll and uh, the Brits don't have an electric guitar manufacturer. The first electric guitar in the United States, no, 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 not Les Paul, George Beauchamp and Adolf Rickenbacker had the first electric guitar. So give credit where credit's due, right? And that's in the United States. I don't know if there was a European cat that did it first. I don't want to get into that. But anyway, um, one of the things that was odd was, at the time, Canada was a palm, or a prisoner of Mother England. And they had no electric guitar companies in Canada, which may have equalized everything. But the reason that the British... Um, put the embargo on there is they wanted to keep the British pound sterling being spent inside of England. They didn't want all their money going overseas. Something that the United States is going through right now with, with Asia and everything else is we send quite a bit of our money overseas instead of right here. So where are we now? Um, what happened? All right, 1959, on June 6, 1959, to be exact, um, the British lifted the embargo. Now, ironically, the 59 Les Paul, yeah, great guitar, right? Did it have something to do with that embargo lifting in 59? I would bet on it. Out of the over 659 uh, Les Pauls that were made, uh, only 179, I think, have been tracked. I imagine there are a lot that are scattered throughout Europe that nobody's ever found, and England. You know, so you've got that going. Now, prior to the U.S. guitars being there, played there, uh, the British had to rely on German guitars, the Hofner, and uh, let me get my list here, because I have to go off the list. The Aristone, the Framus, the Hoyer, the Kira, the Otlin, and the Roger. And then they had Japanese guitars that were available, the Antoria and the Gaiatone. And then there was a British guitar manufacturer, Grimshaw, that I guess kind of went nowhere. Then you had the Swedish guitar manufacturer of Hagstrom, and you had the Czechoslovakian Futurama guitars that were really popular. They had all the push buttons on them and everything. And it's odd that they would spend money on a communist country that they just, you know, basically fought in World War II and, hey, okay, we'll send them money and instead of the United States. Now, there were also the Italian guitar makers, and they came up with some really cool stuff with uh, floating or semi-floating necks 
And uh, Jimmy Page even played a grazioso uh, guitar for a while. And I don't think it was branded on the headstock, but that's the guitar he played for a little bit. Uh, well, a studio musician and then Led Zeppelin. So, having said that, having worked in uh, guitar stores and repair facilities, not in repair facility, uh, one of the things I heard a lot was, uh, what's the difference between the Fender uh, made in Mexico Stratocaster and the American Stratocaster? And I used to say 183 miles. And people would get mad. What do you mean 183 miles? I said, well, that's about the distance from Ensenada, Mexico to Corona, California. So, with the advent of NAFTA and uh, the restrictions on some of the finishes that can or, or can't be done in California, I'm sure it's a lot easier to spray a nitrocellulose guitar in Mexico than it is in California. So, if you figure out where things are getting sprayed, where things are getting put together and shipped and everything else. And there's, there's probably a melding of those two, the American and the Mexican. Now, Fender's also got an Asian line that's out of Japan, and a lot of those guitars are only available for Japanese sale. Now, we go back again to after World War II, uh, U.S. service members stationed in Japan brought back a lot of guitars that weren't allowed in the United States through trade. They, they not saying they weren't allowed, they just weren't available through trade. That's what I should say. And uh, guitars like Takamini and Ibanez, which you'd know as a Mexican name, is a Japanese company. And the Fender Japanese models that, you know, were, were made for a while almost exclusively. And uh, they're still being made. People said it stopped in 2015, and I still have people telling me, no, they're still making J Japanese only Fender guitars. So. It's what's available in their market. They take it very serious. So those guitars were brought back to the United States by service members made popular here, just like the Framus and the Hoffner were brought back from Europe by service members and played in the United States, and people really liked them. But the guitar that was denied was the one being produced in the United States. It drove the demand up. If you can't get something, if it's scarce, scarcity drives price and demand. The price went up, the demand went up. The alternative to that guitar wasn't what people wanted, and it kind of set the U.S. guitar market at the pinnacle. And people go, well, we're, we're the first ones to you know, make an electric guitar. Yeah, we were, but we weren't the first ones to build a guitar. And like I said, people say about the, the Mexican guitars, you know, Fender Mexican guitars, they go, you know, they were building guitars before we were a country, right? Just, just putting that out there. Um, so now we have the advent of Thoman, uh, and people sit there and go, oh, I, Thoman, I can't believe they're, they're doing this stuff, and it's with the Harley Bentons and everything, and it's, oh, it's just cheap stuff. Well, first of all, Thoman's been in business since 1954, all right? They are larger than Sweetwater. Thoman has 1,500 employees, which was the same that Sam Ash had when they went under. Thoman only has two stores, and then they have some distributors throughout Europe. Uh, they have a Scandinavian store, and they have the Germany store, which is um, uh, west of, or east of Frankfurt, north of Bavaria, and right off the Czech border. Now, the Harley Benton guitars, and if somebody out there from Thoman's listening to this, I would love to do a review on one of the Harley Bentons, any of them. Because uh, I know what your mindset is about the product. And they keep the prices low because they do absolutely no marketing. Zero. Now, the guitars are similar to guitars that are in production already around the world. The Fenders, the Gibsons, the PRSs, the Ibanezes, uh, and on and on and on. The Double Necks, whatever they've got. Uh, the price point's low because there's no money that's spent on marketing. And you can't really see the guitar unless you go to Scandinavia or you go to the German store and sit down and play it. And, uh, you know, from what I've heard so far, there are really good reviews on these guitars. Now, the cheapest I've seen one's $173. Um, I've seen some people try and gouge for them on reverb, charging $900 for them and stuff. And I'm like, 
he and them. Um, but the guitars are uh, quality controlled in Germany, even though they're produced in Asia, the quality control is all done there. Now, that's the other difference with Foman. Foman employs a full repair facility for pianos, speakers, guitars. They have luthiers on staff. They've got, you know, the guys that work on pianos on staff. They have pluck machines. They're fully functional. So they're going to repair any equipment that they sell. And this is one of the things the U.S. companies got away from. They got away from the service. They got away from luthier services. They got away from rental services. They got, and they just try to focus on, on the sales portion of it. And it hurt some of the mom and pops and then the big box stores. And so this is where we are. So if you're in your 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, or even 60s like me, and you want to know how did we get here, that's pretty much it. The thing that put the American guitars on top of the market was the embargo by England from 45 to 59. That set us apart from everybody else. Because if you can't get it, it must be great. You know, it was, it was like the forbidden fruit of guitars. What I see going forward is I see an equilibrium. I see Thoman retaking Europe. I see Framus guitars are now offering import models that are much cheaper in the Diablo range and stuff. I'd also like to do a uh, review on a Framus Diablo or any guitar you want to send, Framus. Guys are great. Um, but we're going to see a little more e equilibrium in the markets and we're going to see some balancing. Like I said, right now I see a lot of, a lot of struggling in the U.S. market and that's why I said it's, it's Guitar Mageddon. I would not want to own a guitar shop right now. Uh, a repair facility is great because you guys are always going to break them. I know you guys. Um, but other than that, it's going to be interesting as we move forward. Uh, make your purchases carefully. And if you guys have any comments or what guitars you want me to review and what you want to see on the channel, I've got a little bit more downtime, probably about two and a half months before I'm going to be in the new shop. And I am going to keep you guys posted as that progresses. So I hope you have a great weekend. And remember, only half my ideas are any good. You have to figure out which half. Bye.